Pastor Joe Diaz here from Christian Outreach Ministries of Roswell, Men's Home Morning, Monday morning. Everybody excited? Amen. Yeah. All right. Come on, guys. Give a little shout out. We're going to look back at the Gospels, amen, and I left you last time, we talked a little bit about Jesus, amen, and his ministry, and, and how he was tested, how he was anointed, and we're going to go uh, read Mark chapter 6, 10 through uh, 12, okay, and we're going to talk just a little bit about how the uh, anointing, or olive oil, is used. And the rituals of uh, and then what it represents. It represents the Holy Spirit, okay, and that anointing that comes down. And then we're going to look at a little bit of a, a characteristics of, uh, you know, God. At time, what God does, we don't listen to Him. Worst thing could happen is God will reject you. And that's in this day and age. That's hard for people to understand, okay. And God can reject you. Right? In the day that we hear grace, and, and all we got is grace, and grace, and grace, and, and uh, we'll look a little bit about how people trample the blood of Christ, and by their actions, and by what they do. All right, so let's uh, read this. I'll go ahead and start it off. And also he says to them, in whatever place you enter a home, stay there until uh, stay there till you you depart from that place. Whoever not receive you, nor hear you, and when you depart, shake off the dust from under your feet as a testimony against them. Surely I say unto you, it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah, and in the day of judgment, than for that city. So they went out and preached to the people they should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. All right. So here's the term that we get is that we anoint them with oil. Okay. And that oil, okay, is not something, amen, that is just, uh, uh, you go in the store and buy it. Okay, what does olive oil come from? Olive. Olives. <clears throat> and back in the day, the way they would uh, get these thousands of olives from the trees, and they would put them into this what they call the oil press. And so they would put it, and they put put a rock, some sort of a rock. Actually, it's a. I can't remember exactly what it was. But it was a, a big old stone with a wheel on it, and it press, put the pressure to squeeze them around. They had to walk around, and it was a big stone, and you had to push it. And so it took a lot of work for them to do it. And sometimes they would, if they were had enough money, they would buy a donkey or something, and the donkey would do it. But the process of all those oil would press it down until, and then it would go into a, out of a little uh, spew, Spout, 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 and then it would go into a jar. So they would put, fill it up, you know, thousands of of uh, of uh, olives, and then they would crush them and crush them and crush them and crush them until they were all squeezed out. And the, you know, you probably put a good maybe two or three pounds to get this much of oil. Yeah, takes a lot. Of oil. Yes, it takes a lot. Okay. And yes. Uh, is there, I might be jumping the gun here, but is there any uh, specific reason why it was olive oil? Well, it's because of what it represents. Okay. Oil represents the spirit. God chooses the olive oil because of what it represents, how it looks, how the smell is, okay? Also, you can use it for many things. But these are the rituals that they would use, all right, to bring an anointing okay and they, in in this case they would use the olive oil okay and then he he challenges the book of james says when you pray for something call the elders and get the olive oil and you put it in your hands or you, you place it on the people and you anoint them and pray for healing pray for salvation pray for whatever they're going through this is what the bible says this is what jesus was doing okay so there's a and there's also then we're going to get into this in a second the process 
of a king, priest, and prophet was to be anointed. Okay? When you came into the place and you are going to be a, uh, a king, like Saul, they put oil on him, or David, okay? Anointed, or a, or a prophet, they anointed, they would fill up their horn, grab my horn out of there, the little one. Let me give an example. And they would get the, the, uh, the bring them forward. Of course, there is the ritual of everybody being there. It's an exciting time. It's like when I became a pastor, okay? And before they sent us out, they brought, it, brought me before the congregation. My pastor put a little oil on his hand and he prayed for me and my wife. So Amen. this is what they would use, okay? The ram's horn and fill it up with oil. This is what when when you say when they said, hey, fill up your horn with oil and then go anoint the king. So this is what they would use. They would fill it up and then they would pour it on the the way they did it was a lot more messier than what we do today. Okay? And so they would fill it up and they would place it in there and they would go out and they would anoint the king or a priest or a prophet. And they would pour the oil in there and, and uh, they would dip it. And for, if it was for a king, they would dip it all the way on them, okay, where it dripped on the side. A prophet, they would do it a certain way and so on. So, so you follow me so far? Yes. Let's turn to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16. Now we're going to deal just a little bit, okay, about, first of all, when we look at 1 Samuel 16, this is what, let me give you an example how uh, when you have placed the oil, it's a, Samuel is a man of God, okay, Samuel was a uh, high priest, took over the, the line of Eli, remember Eli passed away, God raised him up since he was a child, okay, into the ministry where the tabernacle was at. And so his function was to keep up the, 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 the work of God. In Samuel's days, they, the, how do you know the book of Judges, right? Book of Judges <clears throat> were about, they had these elders together and they judged the community of Israel. Samuel being the head priest, judge, and ruler that would seek God, and he would have these men together, and they would uh, judge the people for whatever crimes or bless them, whatever they did. And so at this time, the people wanted a king. Okay? People wanted a king. All right? And so God turns and said, it tells them reasons why they shouldn't have a king, because he is the king. But at some point in time, God gave them what they wanted. And so this is where we get King Saul. Okay? Yes? I don't know if I missed it, but did the king, I mean, the judges get anointed with oil too? Yes. Yes, they did. Everybody well, that was uh, in the line of the priesthood or judges got the, always had the anointing. Okay? And they sought out the Lord. Okay? So, what we find in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. Okay, I'm going to read this and then we'll get to the top. But Samuel took his horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. Now he's speaking of David, okay? And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah, okay? So this is just, I'm just trying to, trying to show you the connection between... Uh, uh, the olive oil being poured on David, okay, and this was a ritual that they would do when they transferred the office of king, okay, they would, he would fill up, now what they did with David, he would fill up the horn with oil, okay, and in front of it, he did this in front of his brothers and, and, and his, uh, his dad, okay, and uh, anointed him, now others say that he poured the oil on top of him, where it would fall all the way down. Can you imagine that? You want some anointing? <laughs> I'll put all kinds of. It's like it's like taking a bucket of water and throwing it on you. How long did they leave the oil on? Does it say, Pastor? Or? 
Well, it, it, just leave it on and then you get a rag and you kind of, you know how long it takes for oil to process through? Yes. I mean, it's pretty, it kind of stick, even if you put it in your hand, well, it's oily, and it dries up after some time, okay? But if you have someone praying on you and you're in the middle of the open air, it dries up pretty quick. It's just the process of, of having it poured on you, okay? And so, when this, and, and immediately, as soon as that happened, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samuel, okay? And because this is what God wanted. And we're going to look at David's life and Samuel, or Saul's life here in a second. But the reason the Lord was so strict when it came to the Israel, uh, the, when it came to, uh, uh, to the uh, anointing of oil and the kings and everything, God was really particular in who he wanted and it was about listening to God. Now, one of the major problems that we have, okay, that uh, Saul started out good and ended up bad. <laughs> this is kind of how I'm going to direct this towards your life because we're in this little classroom and how you guys conduct your lives. Okay? So let's look at, you know, when you look at chapter 15... We're going to find a man that, okay, well, Saul, he got anointed, and he loved the Lord. Good morning, young man. Good morning, sir. And God had put him in charge. Now, now Saul had some issues in his life, okay? Now, there's a lot of discrepancies that people use because of Saul, you know, well, why did God use him if he was so prideful and this and this and that? Well, this is what the people wanted. The people wanted someone to stand up and they worship. Because how many know we look at somebody and like, wow, he's big, he's strong, you know, and well, that's our king. You know, look at it, he's got long hair, he's got all, you know, everybody loves him. Okay, but in reality, Saul had some issues. Saul had pride, Saul had insecurity. Okay. And he had a problem of listening. Okay? He didn't listen very well. And when God would tell him to do something, he would do the opposite. Okay? Now, only God, only God, if God anoints somebody to do a work, he's the only one that can remove that person. Okay? It's kind of like... Uh, you know, there's times in life when, in ministry where pastors start out humble, start out great, start out, but in time, like Moses, let's say like Moses. Moses started out great. Moses was a humble servant, but then his anger would get the best of him. The difference between Moses and Saul, Moses had conviction. And when Moses made a mistake, he went to God. It was far and few. Very far and few. But when Moses did make a mistake, it cost him dearly. Saul let his pride get the best of him. All right, let's read this really quick. And uh, Jeremy or, or Isaiah, why don't you uh, read verses 10 and stop at 19. Oh, First Samuel 15? You do. Read it. First Samuel chapter 15, 10 through 19. What did I say? Did I say Jeremy or did I say Isaiah? I'll read it. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, and he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this that he cried out to the Lord all night. Early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him, Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. Then he went on to Gilgath. When Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you. He said, I have carried out the Lord's command. Then what is all the bleeding of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle I hear? Samuel demanded. It's true that the army spared the best of the sheep, goats, and cattle, Saul admitted. But they are going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. We have destroyed everything else. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop. Listen to what the Lord told me last night. And what did he tell you? Saul asked. Samuel told him, Although you may think little of yourself, 
You are not the leader of the tribes of Israel. The Lord has anointed you king of Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, Go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they are all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what is evil in the Lord's sight? So, there's the problem. God told him to do something, and the guy didn't do it. Come on, you guys. You were given an instruction by God. Go off, destroy all these people, okay? Don't take no but nothing from them, all right? <laughs> he gave them the instruction. Here's the problem, okay? Somebody got in Saul's ear. Come on, you guys know what that's like. Somebody got in Saul's ear. And start whispering. Start, yeah. Hey, Saul, why don't you, uh, I know you're instructed to kill everybody and everything, but why don't you take the king, he can serve our purpose, and take all the gold and the cattle for, and, and sacrifice it to God, and God will be pleased by that. But what did God say? Hmm? Take nothing. Take nothing. Okay. But then when you have people in your ear, what are they doing? Influence. Hmm? And what do they say? They use God. Yes, they twist things around. And this causes problems within the heart. Okay? And this is how, what God does, when God finally rejects somebody, I mean, it's a scary place to be in. Okay, because we all are going to make mistakes. All of you are going to do something, okay, in your lifetime. You may get instruction from God himself, okay? And when God instructs us, it's not just for us, but it's for the community. Because when we do something, amen, or mess things <coughs> up, God rejects you. And God, just like God, you know, people want to say, well, God never rejects. Yes, he does. And allows, and like when, and we'll read about it, Saul's life ended up getting a demonic spirit. That demonic spirit, amen, is because it's a very selfish spirit. So when, when God rejects us from his, from his will, and not following the instructions, okay, because he says to him, I want you to go do this, all right? And he listens to somebody else. And you guys have been there. There's not a person in the world, when you're put on a direction to do something, who will come in and say, just veer to the left. Come on, stop right here. Come on, pastor won't get mad. Let's just do this. I ain't going to tell him. Come on. All right, so how does, it, well, how does one stand there and believe that they're doing what's right when God told you not to, when you're given the instruction and to do it a certain way? Why would you let, allow him, why would this man, do you think, will allow himself to fall for that? Come on, you guys got experience. Wasn't worthy. Hmm? Wasn't worthy. That has nothing to do with worthiness. He's, he's the king. To be greedy, wasn't Greedy. Greedy. Yes. <clears throat> what else? Come on. Pride. Pride. Selfish. Selfish. Ignorant. Well. He let his flesh take over. Well, why not? I'm the king. Everything was there. You know? You're the king. You're in charge. You do whatever you want. Oh, my. I wanted to be a people pleaser. <laughs> okay. Those are good answers. So he says, you know, when you when, when many today believe because of grace that God won't reject you. Okay? Now, the first things you have to learn as people of God and men, okay, either I, I'm not a judge, okay? But if you reject God and by your pride and by your arrogance and everything that you do, you're very close. Not just losing your salvation, being rejected by God. 
Okay. And there's a lot of, you know, I know men who will go out of their way and go ask everybody else, as I said before, and they want the approval. But when God speaks into our lives, okay, when you start hearing this and hearing, you're going to go, hey, uh, you're not going to down the whole story why somebody, you know, you're going through what you're going through. You never, don't, you never give them the whole story. Right? We just tell, well, you know, this has happened to me, and this guy's mean with me, and this is that, and this is that. But you never give the whole story about what you did. Just bits and pieces, right? Well, I made some kind of mistake. What did you do? Yeah, no, 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 it's their fault. It's their fault. But what did you do? Now imagine God judges us by our attitudes. How do I know that? No, 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 no. First of all, I'll give you what is written, but yes, I went through it. But how do you think he does that? Mark chapter 5, yeah, Matthew chapter 5. There's a little thing that Jesus speaks about and how people should conduct themselves. Ah, there we go, the light goes on. Okay? And it's called what? Beatitudes. Why is it called Beatitudes? Well, that's the EB looking. EB. Blessed. Beatitudes is having a blessed attitude. Happy in your ad, blessed means happy. Happy, have a happy attitude about things. And so he gives us a list of being blessed in your attitude. <laughs> okay? So he's dealing with what? Attitude. Give me the definition of one's attitude. Display of character. Okay, what else? Uh, conduct. Conduct. Behavior. Yeah. Behavior. <coughs> Mood. A mood, yes. <laughs> The way we speak. Okay? And what Jesus does is he gives us, he points in how, now remember this. Of course he has the multitude. Okay? But he points to the disciples. This is discipleship. The multitude is just listening. Okay? But he's pointing to the disciples on the disciples' conduct and how they should be acting. He's directing his, their lives into being men. You want to be a boy, then you keep having that attitude. You'll never be a man. But Christ is looking into our lives this morning and saying, you must adjust your attitudes. Okay, And he gives us all the blessed of the poor in spirit, for theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, and they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed the merciful, for they will be obtained mercy. Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemaker, for they shall be called sons of God. Now that is a blessing right there. Blessed is the peacemaker. Okay? So that tells us, first of all, other people are going to have a bad heart and messed up attitudes. But here he says, blessed is a peacemaker, for they should be called sons of God. Okay? And blessed are those who persecute for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So we get the attitude of what we're looking at. And sometimes, amen, pride plays a big part of our lives. All right. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Let me give you a few things in why you must adjust your attitude. If you don't want God, fine. You know, I, I'm sorry to say this. You know, that the many will backslide and die in hell. Okay? You don't change your attitude. You, you know, forget this. You're going straight to hell. Okay? When you die, you will die with your arms folded. <laughs> You know what this means? 
Uh, Come on, you guys know what this means. I'm not hearing what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> this says a lot right here. Yeah. Oh, this says a lot. <laughs> yeah, um, this is a sign of pride. There's different ways, you know, like when people do, I'm cold. No, you're not. You're not cold. <laughs> All right, wait a minute. Chapter 10. So uh, when we look at the book of Hebrews, and we're looking at verse 26, says, For if we sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there, are, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but, cert but certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fiery, fiery indignation that will devour the adversary. Anyone who rejects the Moses' laws dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And how much worse punishment do you suppose uh, will he be brought, uh, he, he will be thought worthy he who, who is, <laughs> excuse me, tramples the Son of God under their foot and caught the blood of the covenant which has been sanctified in common things and then insult the spirit of grace okay you go out and deliberately sin this is what he said you are messing up the spirit of grace so in other words God will reject you for not listening to him you know, you got all these grace preachers, these grace, 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 and that doesn't <laughs> give you a license not only to sin, but to act the way you do. You have to act in a certain way. You must adjust your attitude. You must learn to work out. This is the whole point of working out your salvation, okay? Now, there are those who read the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you something. In a time of testing, we go through some big problems in our lives okay but you cannot use because of grace I can do whatever I want and God will forgive me this shows us right here first of all there's two things okay you have the spirit of grace all right which we're under and there's 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 a, a, a doctrines many many doctrines today dispensation, the doctrines of law, and people have a hard time today. Listen to what it says about the laws of Moses. Okay? Those who reject Moses, it's not Moses' law. It's God's law. God had gave the commands to Moses. It's the very breath of God speaking. I'm going to add something about the grace of these preachers that refuse to um, preach against uh, homosexuality and all these sins, and they just want to talk about grace and people do whatever they want to, they're going to be judged because they're parents. Oh, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Well, it's because they're fearful. Yeah. You got them in your, if you have more than 100 people in your congregation, okay, and, and not every one of them are going to be satisfied with what they hear. So if you got a preacher like me who gets up, now don't, let me make sure I get this to you guys understand this. Okay? Sin is sin. <coughs> and we were all a part of that sin. It doesn't matter if you were homosexual or gay or whatever it's called. <laughs> okay? Or a drug addict. Right or adulterer, fornicator, that doesn't matter. Okay, we're all sinners. As God sees it, if He gave grace and allows a dope fiend to come and get saved and receive Jesus, He's not going to remain the drug addict. He wants Him to change that lifestyle. So if someone who has the gay and comes into church. And they say, you know, I don't want to be gay no more. Okay? I don't want to have that on me no more. I want to receive Jesus Christ. So, so, so they're challenged to, to change their lifestyle. Just like we are. 
We have the same amount of grace that we get. The thing is, it's like a person who is a fornicator. Okay, there's no difference. I mean, the difference is that he's sleeping with men or women, and women sleeping with women, but a man comes in and he has a problem with women. All right? And he'll want to sleep with every woman that he has. Well, he's got issues. So he deserves the same amount of grace that everyone else has. So if, if we make ourselves clear, when you hear it on the pulpit, it's like, well, you know, God hates the homosexual and he's going to condemn them. If they don't repent, he will. But if they repent, they have every opportunity to change their lifestyle. No one's saying, like one individual says, well, I, I, I remember we had an individual in our home, he was gay, but he wanted God. Okay? Help them through that. He says, well, I don't, I, I don't want to, I can't marry a woman. I mean, that's just not my thing. And, and, and you know, I, I'm struggling with this. So, well, no one's asking you to go off and marry the first girl. We're asking you to fall in love with Jesus. Amen. And at some point, through prayer, intercession, through counseling, God will do something in your life. You had a question? Sorry. Yeah. Um, this is going to go on like the drug, drug addicts. Yes. The ones that come into the home, the ones that are trying to recover, see that he's all drugged up. But then he says he wants to get saved, does this, and then goes around and backslides. Goes out for about a month, two months, but then comes back. How would that, how would another person reflect on that saying that's pretty much he's got grace, right? Right. Well, that's that's the warning that we that I give. You go out and you're gonna get seven times worse. Yeah. Okay? That has nothing to do with me, like oh you prophesied well, it didn't, that's God's word. You you backslide seven times worse for each sin. Okay? The hope is that they don't go out and use drugs again. Okay? And and if they do, that's what will happen. And so we give a warning. But if they come back, okay, then God forgives. And you're like, no, it didn't work for me. I don't want this. You know, I'm sorry. I made a mistake, Pastor, or I made a mistake. You know, I never want to do that again. Who are we to hold back? <coughs> so we receive them. If it becomes a habitual habit at some point in your life, this is what I'm saying. Grace runs out. You know what we say? I can accept all day long, but God will reject. I can turn around. You see, this is what I do for you guys. Father, please help this guy. Father, this is his 20th time, Lord God. I pray right now. This, Thank you. Believe me. Okay? And so if the individual receives it because they get into a pattern of living, they get into a pattern of their life of it works for a while, it does good, and all of a sudden, the same trial, the same testing, the same enemy comes, and they fall under that. Yes? But when the person comes back after backsliding, and the person that was getting influenced by him, now he would want to go do that because he thinks that he'll be safe because he can go out and get high and then just come back. Well, if you're ignorant and that happens, Okay? At some point in time, those who know better, okay, and do it anyways, all right, that's when the psh, psh, you knew better. Let's say, for instance, I, I turn around and me, okay? I went out and I did that. Forget all this. I'm tired of the pressure. I'm tired of this. And I just, I'm going to go get high. Okay? So I went out and got high, went and did my thing. And then I felt conviction, I felt bad. I, oh, I should have never done that. I'll come back. Oh, Lord, please forgive me. All right, God says, I forgive you. Sit down. But here's the problem. I'm a leader. Okay, That's the problem Saul had. I'm the king. I'm the, no, but God rejects you. You're not, no, no, you're king at, for men, but you're not king for God. Here's the problem with most people that I've had in my experience. People want to come back, and there's something about a title. 
There's something that people want. Forget about the spirit of grace. Forget about backsliding. Okay? It does no longer have to do with that. It's because when God raises you up, you become somebody in the Lord and favors upon your life. And people are watching this. Say, wow, you look what look what's happening in your life. You're, you're gaining access and you're doing good. And all of a sudden, you know, when you fall from grace, you can't come back and expect the same things again. So you become common. And if that's what your life is, that's what it'll always be. Wow. You'll become common. When your word will be nothing. Is that where you mean you have to go all the way back to like kindergarten again? Pretty much. Over? Pretty much because you lost something. Let's start over again. That's the, and that's the hard part for people. Yeah, Believe me. That's why I always share with you. Ozzy, you raised your hand. I'm sorry. Well, you know how the book of the book in the book of Psalms tells us that if a just falls seven times, God will lift them up. Uh, Absolutely. Seven. Absolutely. But here's the problem. Like I said again. Okay, we're gonna get into what Saul's problem was. Okay? He they still want leadership. You know what's happening today in today's world? That there's a lot of pastors and they have been made broadcast on news and so on, who literally went out had had affairs with women and men mm. and still keep their leadership. Went for the congregation, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and still being leaders, still being pastors. Okay? Because why? We have to forgive. Now, people see that and they want, and so... What are they going to do? They're going to preach on forgiveness. Oh, second chances, third chances, everything yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. It's funny to see how a preacher can get up here and preach on adultery when he's an adulterer. Get away with it. Yes. And then all of a sudden he's exposed. Now he wants forgiveness because he's thinking of the money. He's thinking of what he has. Okay. And he doesn't let go. Just like someone who still drink and still do drugs. There's a, there's a man who was in Colorado who had a homosexual affair and he was doing meth. See, it's not just for the congregation. It's for the pastor, too. Okay? And so we can't use grace as a license to sin. Okay? Remember, it's an attitude. It's who you are. You know, you want to break your old way of thinking. I was in the home for a long time. And I watched guys do that. You don't think for a second that it passed my mind. Do you think for one second that I turn around, man, Pastor Johnny gives these guys 20 chances in a day, man, I can go out and do what I want to go do and say I'm sorry. Okay? You don't think that crossed my mind? <laughs> but who am I letting down? God. What's more important to me? God. Your final <coughs> decisions you will make in life is going to say who you are for the rest of your life. When you decide one day you're going to do for you, you're going to get that. And you'll receive the benefits of the world. But when you stand your ground and say, no, I'm going to do this for the Lord, God will bless that. That is a victory and a shout that you will never hear because it's only in heaven. Okay? When you use, now, now when you think about the rejection Okay, this is, let's look back here. But a fearful, fearful, fearful expectation of judgment. In other words, expect judgment if you do your own thing. Expect judgment. How long do you think, you know, Pastor Joe's going to put up with nonsense? <coughs> well, how long would you put up with it? That's right, okay. And why? Because of foolishness. This is what he says. Okay. Fiery indignation, which will devour the adversary. Anyone who rejects the law of Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Oh, I got a perfect picture of this. Okay. If you're standing before God, 
okay? And you have an individual just rejects the Lord, rejects the law, rejects grace, and then God says, you tell, well, why would you act this way? Why would you do this? And according to the laws of Moses, we need two or three witnesses to stand up and say, yeah, he acted this way. He did this, he did that. All right? According to the law of Moses. So the laws of Moses brings death. If two or three witnesses say, no, he doesn't, you know, he's just disobedient, he just doesn't listen. So guess what he deserves? So what's, guess what you guess where they took him? Stone. Stone him. I don't know how to talk about taking him out of stone. <laughs> I'm about putting him out there and going to town with him. Imagine if we did that. I said, you know, guys, this guy don't listen, guys, so let's all stand up and <laughs> beat him down. Get a bunch of rocks. Isn't it true that the first person who speaks up on that throws the first stone? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but the Spirit of Grace does something different. Okay, let me give you uh, uh, In Luke chapter 8, they brought Mary Magdalene, or a woman in adultery. Remember? And they understood the law. You can't accuse somebody without two or three witnesses. But in this case, they had a crowd of witnesses. She broke the law. Now, if you read the law, if Jesus, who knew the law, okay, says you have to bring both to them, you can't just bring one. This, if they said she is caught in adultery in the very act, can she do it by herself? No. Both that. So you must bring both of them. But they, their purpose and motive <coughs> was to test Jesus. And when they brought the woman, they said, well, she's a bonus. We can kill her because she's a prostitute anyways. So let's just do away with her. And, you know, our law says this, our law says that. That's why he says, okay, he, he who's without sin, let him cast the first stone. It's because he knew the law. You had to have both. You can't just have one. It's easy to point a finger. You did it. You, you're the problem. You're the problem. It's easy to say that. Okay? And then everybody might jump up and say, yeah, you are the problem. You are the problem. But the person with malice and vengeance and all what's inside of that heart, that's why Christ says, you know what? If you're without sin, then go for it. Throw it. If you have no sin in your heart, then do what you need to do. If you're righteous and you have no sin, then go ahead. And who is the only person who had the right to stone her? Jesus. And what did he do? That's the spirit of grace. Alright? Listen to what he does. Okay? He bends down and picks her up. Okay. Where others would just say, get up. The difference is that this is what God does. Because when we're down and empty and lonely, He's the one that lifts us up. Amen. He comes with us. That's the Spirit of grace. And if we can obtain that type of things in our life, then we can understand, you know, why the importance of what we, you know, many want to say, the law. Okay, once again. But this is why it's there. Because the laws of God, yes, they they demand death. If we don't live a certain life and obtain that, but that's why Jesus came and died on the cross so we can have that spirit of grace. But in this case, what he's saying that many are trampling over the spirit of grace. You're trampling in the blood. Every time, every attitude, everything that we do, we cannot say. You know, well, you know, my wife, when she deals with the ladies, and and she often says this when when they question or they say certain things, oh, stop right now. Are you saved? And then a silence is there for a minute. I 
I said, really? He says, yeah. It's like they're thinking about it. If you have to question your salvation, what does that say about you? There's only two things in life. There's Jesus and there's a devil. What side do you want? Okay? So what does that say? Are you saved? And if you have to stop and think about it, what, what side are you on then? Yeah, true. It means that you doubt God, right? Yes. So what you have here, let's go back to Samuel, is that when Samuel just didn't listen anymore, okay, uh, Samuel, I mean, excuse me, Saul <coughs> was upset because this is what he says in verse 20. I'm just trying to build the characteristics of Samuel. One of the most important things in your life, uh, 1 Samuel 15. One of the most important things that you guys will encounter in life is that, and you have to remember this, okay? That pride, you think that you got rid of it, it'll always pop up. Always. Always. Okay? And, and you and I have to understand these things. You know, today's world, you know, one of the things that I would hope for one day is that, you know, you guys would become strong leaders, okay? But a, but a good leader has to go through so much. You have to. It, it, you're, you're, it's like the minute you walk out the door, there's, it's like, oh, is this a test? Is this a test? Is this a test? Is this a test? I always tell myself that and this is just for me. I ask myself if I'm actually going to really deliver him a clean body. And I, I, I sort of answer that saying I, I probably won't because the cussing that I still think about and then sometimes it comes out, you know, uh, but I'm, what my answer, my question is, is, is there, will there be anybody to deliver a clean body? I mean, an actual clean body for him to well, you know, I think it would be hard. It's it's not not hard, but then it is. You know, I first got saved. Now you've been in what almost a year? Year, okay. And the first few months, it's just grace and okay, I'm here. Let me deal with it. But how much really does God have an effect on you? Okay, and, and you're not, I'm not just pointing you out. Every, I went through that. Okay, I might say, I'm saved, okay, pray, pray. But at some point, you're still struggling with cussing, you're still struggling with smoking, addictions, and this and that. Mm -hmm. The mind is still going through that. The heart wants God, but the mind is the battle. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so for the first frustration comes in. Failure comes in. Uh, I should have did this, and I should, especially for, for the guys that are older. So all these struggles that come in, and it's a part of it. And you think, well, I used to cuss. One time I had this little youngster, and he was just bugging me and bugging. You mother, <laughs> I started cussing him out. I wanted to wring his neck. I wanted to just grab him and start going to town on him. <laughs> And, and uh, I was really, and I felt bad about it. But every time something would go on, I would, oh, yes. Okay? Or I would, I would tell the brother, man, you put, I'm not going to put up with the bleep, bleep, bleep. And, and one day, the guy said, stop cussing, man. I said, I know, I know, I need to stop, I need to stop. <laughs> and this went on and on and on, and I would ask God, stop that. I don't want, I would never do that in front of Pastor Danny, but then again, I didn't want to talk to Pastor. Because I was afraid of just cussing one day, just coming out like that. And so, I fast. I fast, I pray. I said, I don't want to do that no more. I don't want to do it no more. And it took time. When you put something in your mind, you have a mindset about something, you can say no to it, and you eventually will overcome it. It takes it takes will. It's like you know how we get strong will. No, I don't want to do this. I'm gonna do everything. <laughs> okay, and that's how you have to feel about 
when it comes to God. You don't want to dishonor him. And by your actions, you're dishonoring him. It's not intentional. It may feel intentional, but it's not something you really want because when I confront you, if I have to tell you, well, why are you still doing that? I don't know. I don't know. Right? Yeah. I don't know. It's still my part of my flesh. Well, exactly. Some, you see, here's the problem with growth. Some people, it takes a lot longer than others, it, they can catch it. Okay? And, and the process of that, okay, it's like you're learning, you're learning, you're learning. You're never, I'm still learning. You never stop learning. Because God's always trying to do something different in your life. All right? No matter how much you may think, it's not God. It is God. God's trying to work something different in your life. And the struggle is, is that we have a flesh. And we have our own way of doing things. And so God says, no, to do my will, you have to do it in purity, in holiness. And purity and holiness is very boring. Okay? It's a struggle. And so this is the problem that Saul had. Okay? He gave an instruction, I want you to do this and this, and he just didn't listen. Because why? He got influenced by somebody else to change the direction of God. Then God got mad. Okay? One thing is for us to reject each other, but when God rejects you, how many have a hard time of understanding that? <coughs> Come on. Is that would that be like in the sense of him not hearing your prayer or you Exactly. Pray? Well, you're not you're not praying anyway because who are you listening to? Okay. Verse 20. Okay. Remember. Pastor came in. <laughs> Pastor Samuel walks in, and Saul greets him, okay? Let me break it down for you guys. Pastor walks in and sees the director, <laughs> and hears all the celebrations and nonsense. He says, what's going on here? Oh, I brought this for God. It's for you. I brought this for you. Here's your blessing. All right? And, and saw uh, Samuel, he said, here's the moaning and the thing. And he brings the king. I saved the king. I brought all the goods to sacrifice it to God. And then Samuel gets upset. He gets upset. Tells him, Isn't that what God told you? Let's look at it real quick. Verse 20. And Samuel, uh, Saul says to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission in which the Lord had sent me and brought back Agai, the king of the Amorite. I've utterly destroyed the Amorites, but the people took, listen, did you hear what he said? Mm -hmm. But the people took the plunders, the sheep and the oxen and the best of things, which we should have utterly destroyed, and to sacrifice to the Lord God, to the Lord your God at Gilgal. <laughs> so who does he blame? Oh, it wasn't my fault. It was their fault. They did it. They did it. They like to say a lot of things. <laughs> okay, so here, this is what Samuel says. Has the Lord, as the Lord, as great delight in, in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as it obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice, and to heed. Uh, the fat of the rams for rebellion as a as a sin in witchcraft and stubborn as iniquity as idolatry 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 excuse me but you have rejected the word of the Lord and he has also rejected you from your king mm. Mm. this is what he goes let's go on to what he says then Saul says to Samuel I have sinned for I have transgressed the command of the Lord uh, uh, and your words because I have feared the people and obeyed their voice. 
Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel says to Saul, I will not return with you for, the, for you have been rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. But here's what the, the young man, see, let me tell you something. God is the one that removes the leadership. And he could still repent as he, but he repented to, instead of saying, I sinned before God, he said, I, I sinned before your God. You see, there's things that it's in his heart that really comes out. Okay? And he committed a sin before his God. That's what he says. You know, if Samuel, excuse me, if Saul could accept it and say, you know, because God had other plans. God says, I'm going to make David my king. I rejected Saul and David's going to be my king. Okay? So he would have kept Saul as an advisor to King David, let's say, for instance. Okay? And many, many people in leadership can't accept that. Because we don't want to go out like that. That's something bad. I gotta sit you down. Nobody wants to sit. You know, you know what happens when you sit somebody down, like in a congregation or whatever? Why? Embarrassed? Ashamed? Huh? Questions will be asked. Yes. Why? What happened? Why are you sitting down? What's going on with you? You know, when you're pulled away from something because you, it's not so much how you're doing it, it's the character in you're doing it. Let's say, for instance, I said, hey, I want you to go over here and do this, and can you do that, do that, and, and or you're, one of your leaders asks you to do something, and you, you just start doing that. I'm done. Is that a good attitude? Nope. No. Huh? No. But that's the way you do it. Because why? Figure. Mad. Frustrated. The difference is, is there's ways of being frustrated. Now take for instance, let's give you an example of what you guys go through. Okay, let's say for instance, one of you start thinking of certain things in the morning and your mind starts playing with family. Start thinking of things you missed and how things that you go through. I missed this up, I missed up that. And then, okay, come on, let's go and pray. Like, I don't want to pray. I don't want to do nothing. Come on, let's pray. Come on, let's all get hands and just love the Lord. No. Come on now. Right? And you walk away and you, all day long. And everybody's walking around you, come on, let's go. Soon enough, guess what you're going to end up doing? What are you going to end up doing? That spirit ends up either going to, yeah, either you're going to sit around and say, get this guy out of here. Or you're going to walk around. It's the demonic spirit. Yes. You know why? It's because the heart is not right. Not right. And I remember one time I was frustrated and I was mad, not because I used to tell the brothers, nothing that you guys did is me. <laughs> it's not, it's so bad. I, this thing up here is messed up. Okay? My brother Robert, let me pray for you, Joe. Let me pray for you. Come here. And I'd be like, get away from me. Uh, I want, just, just don't touch me. No, 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 no. So, all right, pray for me. And then one day, I was, he was sweep the front yard, sweep the front yard, and I was just like this, and I started getting, <laughs> I threw the thing down, I turned around, Pastor Daddy's right there, all the, oh. and Pastor just looks at me, and he's all, poor broom. <laughs> What's wrong with you? And I said, it's nothing, anybody, else. I know it's nothing over there, it's you. Now I'm the one to talk about feelings and emotions. 
for some reason, I can just tell him about everything. I screwed up. I did this. I lost my kids. I did that. Yeah, yeah, you are a screw up. I was like, oh, well, wait a minute. You're supposed to make me feel better here. Right? Just, right? No, that's, this is why who you are. Look at you. You get mad, you take it out on everybody. What did you come here for? Change. Does that change? No. You know what that's called right there? What? Pride. Oh my gosh, you thought you got rid of that? It comes back like that. It comes out like that. See, if Saul would just listen, okay? If Saul would just listen for a second, you know what the sad part is? Samuel loved him. Samuel loved him. This is what he says about Samuel. Samuel turns and, and God has to tell Samuel, you know, you need, to, you need to stop crying over this guy. And, and this is what he says in chapter 16. He says, now the Lord says to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? How long are you going to mourn for this guy, dummy? You know, there, there's, God tries to tell us, you know, you see, you don't see your lives. Okay, right now we're at a standstill, and, and there's not too many guys, and I always see it like this. Well, I know some of you, they're going to stay, and some of you are going to leave or be asked to leave. Okay? That's going to happen some point in your life. Okay? Now, some of you will go back to nothing. Well, others of you, if you listen and you're obedient, will obtain very much and stay grounded. Hmm. All right? And when you go back to the world, some of you other ones <laughs> will go back to the world, you will die. Yeah. Okay? Mark my words, because you're just not obedient. And when you're not obedient, the only thing left for you is death. You're going to OD, a drive-by, something in that realm, because the devil knows, I got you. And once you fulfill the, the destiny of the enemy, he'll come and take your life. How do I know? It happens. Every guy that did not listen. Coincidence? Nah. God? No. Them. They just won't listen. And Saul's life, if you read about it, amen, his life was in the same area. Now Samuel, amen, was mourning over Saul, and a part of his grief, amen, because he had a deep love for Saul, not just for Saul, but just to check this out, this is what I look at, for his family. Saul was looking at Jonathan, Michael, his other two sons, the wife. Samuel was looking at how this is going to affect his family. But not for one second did Saul do that. You know, when you're, you're, the hope is that, you know, if you told, you know, I'm getting help. Because this is what everybody does when they come into a place or even if they come into a church, I got saved. Wow, all right. People are like, mom and dad, go, hey, great. You're getting some help. They're going to help you there. Wow. You know, so what do they expect to see? Change. Yes. Come on, guys, say it with me. Change. Change. Come on, say it. Change. Change. But what are they going to see when you get back? Same. Probably worse. Worse. Because why? When you reject God, seven times worse it comes. Run your plans will succeed. 
Thank you, Ray. <laughs> and how does Ray know? Because I went through it three or four times. <laughs> See, you can learn a lesson from others and submit under the will of God and say, okay, I don't want to do that. Like Saul should have did. Okay. And think about, for one second, you think about your families and what the expectation is. But when you don't do those things, Okay, what do you think is going to happen? In this case, Samuel was mourning, not just for Saul, but his family, uh, his family as well. They knew, uh, he knew what was going to happen when it came to God. He took God serious. Okay, he, you know, some of the things that, that Samuel was looking <coughs> toward as well, it was uh, the past, how they handled things through judges and all that, but now God's involved. God's involved with all this, okay? And many Christians today, we get stuck into those things, okay? We get stuck into certain things of your life. And if you don't try to change those patterns and put the patterns of God in you, this is why do we ask you guys to pray in the morning? Come on. Preparing for the day. Preparing for the day, what else? Well, you're going to pray for your family at least, no? What up, huh? I come to realize that not everybody wants to build a relationship with the body of Christ or God. Yes. If Samuel was mourning Saul, mm -hmm. why was he afraid to go back because Saul was... Because Saul would have him killed. Yeah, why? Why was he afraid? Because they have him killed. No matter how much you're still a man of God, you like your flesh. I don't, want to die. I don't want to die early yet. <laughs> but he did have that fear. He did. But if you notice that when, when Samuel went to go confront him, he had no fear of, Sam, of Saul. Fear always catches him. You know, there's always, no matter what you guys do or whatever, there's always a fear. The fear is not so much of losing your <coughs> life, it's of what God's going to do to you. Okay? What God can do to you. Yes. Oh, this sounds like a dumb question, no, but, uh, but um, this whole scriptures I'm reading reading with you, and it's saying the Lord told this man, and the Lord told this man. So, like, is that directly he's talking to him, or is there like? Okay, let's go. Let's let's look at that for a second. Uh, they have these what they call ephods. Okay, an ephod, a little square with oh, all no. the tribes of different diamonds. And then uh, the only one that could put this on was the high priest, in this case, Samuel. Okay. And then when they would ask God for something, okay, the Spirit of God would usually fall upon him. Sometimes it would speak directly into his heart. Other times it would speak through the ephod. And it would shine different ways. It's kind of like uh, signals. Still the base. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And that's how God would at various times speak. Other words, if he would go directly into a, a place of prayer, usually the tabernacle. Remember, when the tabernacle, when the Spirit of God would come down upon the tabernacle, mm -hmm. then God would speak. How God spoke to them is, as we read, we just say, well, the Spirit of the Lord spoke. Right. Okay. Now, remember, God uses the Holy Spirit. How does God speak to us as we're... Now, let me tell you, okay, when I'm preaching or whatever, we receive something from God, and God says, you know, you receive it. It's like an outpouring. It's like you receive it in here, and in your gut you feel it, and then we speak it out. So God, you know, it's various ways. In this particular time, he used the ephod, the tabernacle. It all depends how God wanted to communicate with him. But either way, God spoke to them. And when God, with things are with God, that God, you would see it through. But there's also the enemy's will. And Saul, there's, I, you know, I can't, and in our experience, because at the end of this, Saul commits suicide. Okay? Saul ends up chasing David all over the place. 
Okay, I, now listen to this, okay? Uh, oftentimes, you know, I've been in places where I should have been shot and killed. I've been in, in, uh, in the middle of gunfire and not even hit me one time. I've, I've been in drive-bys, okay, in the actual car and them shooting back. Uh, you know, I've been in situations where should have been dead, okay? Now, I always put this to uh, a praying mother, a praying sister, and a church that would pray for me. Okay? Now, by God's grace, if I happen to get shot, stabbed, I'm still alive. Why? If, and I tried killing myself three times. Okay? Got the scars for it. Got a knife, went <laughs> All right? I was then I passed out, I was in blood, and then woke up in the psychiatric ward. Second time, uh, stood up on a bridge. Okay, stood up on a bridge, high as a kite. I did want to die. Okay, didn't have the guts to jump off the freeway. Okay, in the morning, at, at 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the morning, the 5 freeway is just moving up and down with cars. Okay. Came out in the newspaper, they had a picture of me. All right? Held up the freeway for like six hours. Okay? And then all kinds of cops came around, all that nonsense. Then the third time, I got a cord, put it around my neck, hung it on the thing of the, of, uh, of the garage, and I jumped and the thing broke. <laughs> Sat there and thought to myself, man, I can't even kill myself. Okay, and, and, and can never understand why. Why could I just end it? You know, the devil wants, you know, if you look at Saul's life, he does all this stuff and chases David and gets demonic spirits on him and all types of things that are happening to him. And, and he meets Endor and all this stuff. He goes after uh, witchcraft and all this other stuff. He still can't die until the final end. He's in the middle of battle, fighting people and everything, and no one wants to touch him. No one wants to come and kill Saul for some reason. And then Saul turns around, he gets his own knife and bah! And then they kill Jonathan, then they kill his other son, and it's done. You know why? Because that's just what we do to ourselves. Yes? Didn't somebody finish him off though when he already had killed himself and like, they killed him for doing that? It's besides the point. He's already did it to himself. You know, at the end of life, you know, the devil's like, okay, you know, God's watching over you, but at some point, you're going to keep going where you're going. I'm going to come get you. The enemy knows when you have a certain purpose in your life, Soon enough, what you're going to do, you're going to do to yourself, and time will run out. Okay, it's like I keep telling heroin addicts, stop doing what you're doing because you're going to OD and die. Okay? Well, I'm just chipping, just chipping. Yeah, just that one time. Just that last time is the last time you'll breathe air. That's the last time. And when you do that, you're going to die. And nobody does it to you, but you do it to yourself. So eventually the devil stands over, keep doing what you're doing. Allow this to happen to you, allow this to happen to you. And soon enough, you'll end up in hell. Basically that's exactly what happens to King Saul. And this is what happens when we, uh, it's like, like what Samuel did, he had an attachment towards Saul. He watched him grow up as a king. He was there. He just wanted him to do what the right thing was. But eventually, he just did not listen to God. When we don't listen to God anymore, there comes a time in your life when the Spirit of God will leave you. And it will reject you. Now let's look at here, it's chapter 16 really quick. Come here, follow me so far. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jeremy, read... Uh, Read verses 2. Oh, no, read verse. 
That's it. Read one through. Uh, read one. I'll get there. One through ten. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord had said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Okay, so here we go again. Okay, let me give you a little background on, on Brother Ilya. Is that how you say his name? Ilya. I always call him Ilya. Ilya. <laughs> Ilya. Ilya was kind of like Saul. He was tall, strong. Uh, he looked like a king, all right? He fit the stature of a king. And, and see, many times how we look at things, we look to replace somebody by the first eyes that we see. Now, I know people, amen, like uh, uh, when you guys tell me, well, when I went home, okay, it was the same thing with me. I go like a cholo, all right? Your average banger, that was it, all right? When you come into the program or whatever you guys have, some of you guys have long hair, short hair, bald head, whatever kind of head, okay, it's not how you guys look. Although many will judge you on how you look, okay? They look at when you walk in somewhere, they don't see you. They don't see what God sees in you. They see Hey, that guy hurt me. This guy robbed me. Or that guy burned me. Or this guy did that. Okay? They don't see anything else. There's no announcement before you walk in. Look at I changed. I have Jesus with me. There's no announcement. When you walk into some place, first thing is we look at somebody and we measure them up and down. Uh, I remember I used to look at guys, I think I could take him. <laughs> Pretty sure I can. Alright? That was the first thing I used to do all the time. And you look at somebody, it's how do you measure that person? Okay? What are we looking for? No. Okay, flaws, what else? Come on. When you look at somebody, what do you expect? Come on, all of you heard rumors about me before you came into the home. Huh? Good, bad. You lost your body language. Huh? I lost your body language. Okay, the body language. When you hear, well, he's a man of God, what do you expect? You guys see angels flying and looks. Come on. What do you expect? Serious, straightforward. Don't mess around with this man of God. Okay. What else? Come on. I was told you were very strict, so I expected. It can be. <laughs> I was told that you were stricter than Patrick Day. Stricter? No, I used to be. <laughs> Come on. What else? Yes. Okay. I mean, when you first see the man, what is your... Oh, yeah. I thought you were very mean. <laughs> Come on. His demeanor. Okay, his demeanor. <laughs> Body language. Yes. Big mustache. Big mustache. <laughs> oh, come on. 
I'm trying to get you to the place where Samuel walked in, and God says, well, go to Jesse's house and look at his sons, okay? And, and, and he's looking for another song. Yes. He's looking for another song. But that's not what God looks at. You know, I know, you know, I've taken you guys with me to different churches. You guys have been with me to California with my pastor or other churches or whatever the case may be. Other pastors, you know, or, or, or the congregation will see you guys walk in for conference. And they all put already that everybody in our ministry knows, okay, we don't, nobody talks to the men's over. Right? But they look at you. What do they see? Out dress. Some drug addicts. Drug addicts. Like uh, my daughter had went to uh, the Passover barbecue that one time. Yeah. And she was there. She met you. And uh, afterwards, she told me. She said, "You know," she said, "I was looking at uh, the pastor." She said, "I thought he was one of you guys." Amen. <laughs> <laughs> she did yeah. tell. He started uh, praying. He's knowledgeable. <laughs> but that's what she was looking at. You know? I get that a lot. I get that a lot. I had a young man that said, where's the pastor? And I'm like, I'm right here. And he's like, no way. You're like one of us. He's <laughs> like one of you. I am. <laughs> you see, that's the difference in what people perceive. Okay? There's different, and you look around, you represent each and every different culture. Okay, you represent a, a family. Regardless if you're an outcast of your family, because David was an outcast, okay? There's a whole lot about David that we can learn about, and we all have the similar rejections. Like David's father rejected him, okay? David's father hated him. The reason David's father put him out of the pasture to go look at the sheep away from the city because he wanted him to get eaten by a lion. Okay? And, and uh, that goes back to David, I mean, Jesse's first wife. He had two wives. Okay? It seemed like they all had concubines and wives in those days. And don't ask me why, okay? Because only God knows. But it seems like, uh, for whatever reason, he rejected him because of his calling, because of whatever. Now, he was a man of God at some point, but his heart wasn't right with God. But on the outside, he had all the emotionals. I mean, he could read a scripture. He can, you know, pray. He could do a lot of things. But as a father, he wasn't a good dad. He rejected his own. He did not like David. He thought David was out of adultery. But there's a whole story behind that. But so he rejected it. As a matter of fact, he would have a take. You can find this in Jewish history, okay? And and David was, they had a big table. He had seven other brothers, a couple sisters, and David was the last. And they would all sit on a table and eat dinner. And David and his mother had a little table away from everybody, kind of getting the scraps, Okay? Father would look at him with anger and just get out of here. Get out of here. So we can kind of identify, he can identify, David's story kind of identifies with ours. Yes? So is it true David was from an adulterer? No. No. David's wife, first wife, was barren for a bit. Then Jesse felt, he was found out that he was born out of a different tribe or whatever, did not like, he thought, I'm going to marry somebody else, and he rejected his first wife, and then the night that he was supposed to be with his wife, they kind of did a Rachel and Leah thing. They fooled him, and he slept with her and pregnant her. But after he had so many kids from another wife, I mean, it's just a big old, almost like a soap, soap opera, okay? <laughs> All right, so anyway, so we can understand a little bit of the story when it comes to David. But what, what Saul was, Samuel was looking for was another Saul. 
But God says, see, here's the thing, and that because if you look back, go ch chapter 18 really quick. Who's doing for Daniel? Yes. Uh, or chapter 17. And here's why God rejects, what's his name? Eliab. Eliab. Chapter 28, or verse 28. Read that, Jeremy, from verse, uh, stop at verse 29. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Okay, the reason why this young man got mad, if you read the, that, here David is called to go help feed his brothers, and they're all in battle. Okay, they're all getting ready. And then there's Goliath calling people out, and nobody's moving. Now here's his brother. He's pretty tall, pretty strong. This is what he saw with Eli, uh, that uh, Eli saw him, but what is he doing? He's standing there, and he's getting mad at his brother because his brother, hey, come on, you know how you think big brothers are. <laughs> this is our fight. Well, you're not doing nothing. Okay? Well, his purpose in his heart because the, this young man had fear. As big as he was, he still had fear. Come on. Come on, come on. You guys are rah, 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 but inside you. Come on, you guys. Remember we spoke about one individual? He's like, rah, 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 rah. What's his name? Uh, oh. Alfred. <laughs> Alfred was screaming, scary, and looked mad. And rah, but inside he was scared. Okay? And so what God seen was that fear. God seen fear in his life. He wouldn't make a good leader. Amen. And he, he this is what God seen. That, hey, you know, he's not the one I'm choosing for you. But Samuel, first when he walks in, he sees that. Well, this has got to be the guy. You know? My leader says the person who does not want to lead is the one that should lead. <laughs> Are you here? Because you know, like, I, I didn't want to be a leader. No, that's why you need to be the leader. Why? They see something in you more than you see something in yourself. We see the fear of anger. We see the fear of reaction. We see the fear of intimidation. We have fears that somebody's going to cross you. You don't want to hurt nobody. You, you, there's all types of things. Too much responsibility. I don't know if I can handle it. I'll run. I'll get out of here because I'm not good at handling things. But the man of God said, I'm going to teach you all these things you need to know. You're not alone in this. In other words, before you're given the key, there comes trust to having those keys. Okay? There comes trust. You're given the money box, there comes trust. Okay? But when you're given people's lives, there comes trust. And you don't want to operate on the flesh. You got to remember you're a steward of what God has for your life. All right? And that comes from anointing. That comes from a lot of prayer. You're here to change who you are. God sees who you are. When God sees past all this nonsense, he gets into the heart and says, man, that's, that's my guy. Just let me just mold him a bit. Let me put him on that potter's wheel and just <laughs> Uh, what do you do when you make tortillas? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And then what you do, snap it. And then you roll it down. <laughs> and you get it and you put it on there. And it takes almost an hour to make a gang of tortillas, but how long does it take to finish them? <laughs> and then you have to put some butter. <laughs> it's all gone. Wonderful things are happening. <laughs> okay, so let's read this. So God says, this is not the one I choose. For God chooses, uh, God looks at the heart and not at the stature of a man, basically, right? Yes. So Samuel wrote, and, he, and he, after uh, he asked him, is there other, another son that you have? And then all the young men that went before him. Oh, and Samuel says to Jesse, send, uh, send him and bring him, uh, for he will sit down until he, we will sit down not until he comes. And so they brought him, and now he was ruddy, okay, with bright eyes, good looking. And then the Lord says, arise, arise, anoint him. This is the one. Can you imagine that? This skinny little boy, this this little man, okay, this is the guy I choose. You know, and it's just like God. The Bible teaches us in Ezekiel chapter 16 that God loves small beginnings and humble people. Okay? What's how hard is it for us in the world because we came out of a world of pride, a world of this, a world of that, nonsense, hurt, rejection, wives left you, girlfriends left you, pour your heart in, marriages, and all these other things. We harden our heart, but then we come into, into what God wants to rebuild in our lives, okay, and he begins to soften that. But really inside there's a humble man. There's, just, there's a humble person there who wants to do what's right. Okay, yes. And God, this is what this is what the difference between the day to day and back then. David was humble before God. You can read his exploits, amen, throughout the Word of God, throughout the book of Psalms. I think Johnny covered uh, Psalms 23, right? Right. His yea, they walked through the valley of shadow of death. Well, that's what he experienced. Every time his dad said, Get out of here and go watch them sheep. He had to walk through the valley of shadow of death. Imagine walking by yourself out there. He didn't have a helper. He walks out there, and he's going through the valley of shadow of death. And where he's going to watch his sheep. Why should I give my life for these dumb animals? <laughs> but in his mind, those were his fathers and their fathers. Those, you know what he, David loved the sheep? Because they were God's sacrifices. They were set apart for the Lord. He knew that his father would go and say, bring me a sheep so we can sacrifice to the Lord, dummy. And then he would go and grab himself a sheep so they, so he knew that. And what did he say? I, what did I have? My rod and my staff. That's it. That's all he had. He had his little slingshot. Imagine how much time did he have to develop for that thing. You think about it. Shooting rocks. Shooting rocks. Yeah, those things are cool. Yeah, yeah, all day long. <laughs> all day long. You think of a slingshot, you think of one like this. No. Uh -huh. They had one, they had to put it in the pouch and then. Oh, I thought you were doing like a whip or something. <laughs> yeah. so a little slingshot, a little pouch like that, put a rock in it. Whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> you can imagine how many, uh, how many birds and things he must have hit. Uh, <laughs> so you think about some of the things in that scripture that, talk, that David shares about. How much time did he think that you, he had with the Lord out there? And he, and the one thing that David, that we find that David did, is that he took his responsibility serious. The only bad thing that I can see about all that is that he was very alone. Okay, but he was alone with the Lord. 
and he began to develop a relationship with God. And so this is what the Bible says. And so Samuel took his horn with oil, remember what the oil, and he anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And so Samuel rose and he went to Ramah. Okay, listen to, let's look at uh, verse 14. Yes, no, 16, 16, sorry. Because let me tell you something, uh, that God turns around and as soon as the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him, now here's what happens to Saul. Verse 14 says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant says to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Now, one other scripture, that, uh, if you want to look up the word distressing or, or, or troubling, and many believe that it is a demonic spirit or a depressing spirit. Tor Mine says tormenting. Tormented. You look at the word torment. Hex. Okay? Vex. Vexed. The Bible says in first or second Peter, the spirit of vex, vex, I can't say that word. <laughs> yeah, came upon yeah, it came upon Lot because he did not do nothing about what he saw. Remember, he was in Sodom and Gomorrah, all the things, but it vexed him. Vexed. Yes, vexed, tormented. Now, because of his pride and his his attitude towards the things of God and not obeying God, all of a sudden the spirit, the spirit of God leaves him, and then a tormenting spirit comes. A demonic spirit comes. This is what I said. Either you're you're for God, then you will receive what God has for you. If you reject God, then you're going to receive what the devil has for you. And the biggest thing that the devil can do to you is scare you, torment your mind. You'll lose sleep. You'll go through nightmares. You'll be, you'll be, all kinds of issues will happen. And he was depressed and cried and so on. Yes. Pastor, did, uh, after David got anointed by Samuel and killed Goliath and all that, did, did his family, brothers, father respect him after that, or did they still despise him? Uh, well, it doesn't really talk about, but according to uh, one of the historians, is that they were very jealous of him. And they stood where they were at in their own town, because in second or for the last part of First Samuel, he goes home, and they're like, hey, don't bring this trouble to us. Get out of here, his dad did. His brothers, are, you know, they... When he became king, his brothers were like, hey, brother David. <laughs> so that's what usually happens. So, But here you're looking at how God had a perfect plan. You know what God does? Okay? Which, oh, you guys are going to love this part. <laughs> a distress, death, distressing spirit from God is troubling you. This is what he says. Verse 16 says, Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player of the harp. <laughs> oh, and he shall be the one that he will play with his hand and the distressing spirit from God is upon you. He shall be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide me and now a man who can play a harp and bring him to me. Then one servant answers, and look, as I have seen the son of Jesse at Beth of Bethlehem with a skillful and plain, he said, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and, and handsome, a handsome person, person, and the Lord says, and the Lord is with, it, with him. Therefore Saul sent a message to Jesse to send me your son David. If you're going to learn how to be a king, go hang out with a king. Okay? There's still hope for Saul. 
They are going to help each other. Okay. This is where, you know, when I used to have uh, bad dreams and all this other stuff, and I remember, and I read the scripture over and over and over, but it, it, that's why I listen to, uh, uh, because the enemy attacks us. I don't get him as much anymore. It has become more habit than anything to listen to worship music. But it really sustained my spirit in man. It really helps me to, to uh, listen to worship music. It calms my nerves, my anxiety. Even when I'm home at time. One time I went home, and my wife, we, we, we both believe in this. Okay, when I get home, I can hear the music playing, and I walk in, and there's such a presence of God. Okay? And, and even to the point where the boys are just, <laughs> calm down. You know, I remember one time walking in, and I was going through some tough times when I was just building the church and trying, and outreach and I was out there passing out flyers it was over 100 degrees it was just hot Amen. and I was going through it because I can't get no response in my church and nothing going on I'm out there by myself passing out flyers you know trying to win salt and I was just broken like man this is just not working I was frustrated I was mad and then when I got home my wife was listening to worship music and then I sat down and I just broke I just sat there, man, like, oh, Lord, you're so good. I'm mean, thinking selfishly of myself, and you, oh, God is good. And it's just the peace of God to let you know what? I got you. Don't worry about this. I'll take care of you. You know, and when David would show up with his heart and just start strumming, and all of a sudden Saul had peace. And when Saul had peace upon his life, he was willing to share with David. And then he took a liking to him. But then there, at the same time, all of a sudden, enough that when David would stop playing and just be there, and all of a sudden, that anger and jealousy rised up. That spirit came out again. And that's why he turned around and tried to kill him. You see, this is what, see, but God knows everything. And this is why it's important that when you receive the Lord and you're walking with God and God will bring that anointing. But the one thing that God looks at, he looks at your pride. He looks at your pride. He looks at into your life right now and he sees the areas you need work in. Okay. And here's the hard part is because no one likes to be called out on anything. Okay. But when you start listening and start losing these things here, and God's saying, okay, you still need more work. You need to see time to grow. You still need this. And then you'll start being convicted. And then, you know, conviction, believe it or not, is good. It's really good. You can't allow people to get in your ears like Saul did. You can't allow the enemy to come in and tell you, you know, try to, as you guys say, pump each other up can't do that. It's not of God. Your choices in your life are to do what's right before God. Make the right choices in your life. That's why we're led by the Holy Spirit. This is what the Holy Spirit ends up doing. When you're anointed by oil, all of a sudden you get to, let me tell you something, when you get to different stages in your life, the more you get more trials and more problems. Okay? Some people fear that. Well, I don't want to go farther than this. Well, then you'll stay stuck. Okay, you'll be that guy in the, in, working in a warehouse for the next 20 years sweeping the floors. Okay? You can sweep the floor for the rest of your life. How many want to sweep the floors for the rest of their lives? Huh? You can dig a hole or you can have, or you can be the owner and have people dig the holes for you. Which one do you want to be? Okay. Then you have to accept challenges. And when you accept challenges from God, this is why God brings that special purpose in your life. And we read, amen, about the failures. Now, believe it or not, at some point in his life, David messes up. How many want to know more about David and Saul? Because you can learn from their mistakes. I've learned a lot 
from reading the scriptures on how to handle things and how to do things. Okay, and when 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 uh, David would play the music, then Saul would become calm. Yes. Saul ended up loving David, though, right? Well, he had a love hate for him. Come on, you guys, you guys do that all the time. I love that guy, but I hate him. Yeah. Did he know that he was anointed? Saul. Yeah. He knew. You can. One thing about anointing, you can see it. One thing about a person walking with the Lord, not one who says, "I'm anointed by God." No, 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 no. You can see it. You can see it, man, their love for God. You can see it. All right? You don't have to stand up and say all the righteous things. And all. Oh, I pray that God holds you and keeps you. And may the peace of the Lord go by you. And may God just bring an anointing. For I am the anointing. No, shut up. Okay? <laughs> you don't need all that. All you guys need to hear that God loves you. And he has you. And, he, and you can... You will able to understand the difference between all that. It kills me when I hear people do that stuff. I'm, I'm just real. When it comes to serving God, I'm real about it. Okay, I'm sorry. That's just who I am. But as we continue on, we're going to stop right there for today. Amen. So I hope you guys got a lot by it and, and meditate. And uh, we'll be here back here Wednesday morning. All right. Say amen. Amen. Yeah. All right. And we're going to learn more about David and more about Saul. And let me tell you that because God reminds us at times, we're all going to be put in circumstances, situations, and every circumstance and every situation is to develop your spiritual growth. It's all, that's why God put uh, David and Saul together, was to develop his spiritual growth. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stop right there. Father, we just thank you this morning, Lord God, and I just pray for the Holy Spirit to continue in our lives. Father, we ask you the rest of the day be blessed, Lord God. Help us to grow, Lord God, in your spirit. We love you today in Jesus' name. Amen. And don't forget, you like it on YouTube, like and subscribe. Everybody do this. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see you later. God bless.